Hola, damas y caballeros. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, HUD family at headquarters, and those tuning in by live webcast link. Thank you for attending the 2023 Hispanic Heritage Month observance. We are truly honored and thrilled to have you here today as we come together to celebrate the rich tapestry of Hispanic Latino heritage that contributes so vibrantly to the mosaic of our nation's culture. Before I move forward, make sure that your cell phones are muted. Make sure that we got that taken care of because we're gonna have a great show and we don't need it to be interrupted by that, so let's, let's do that. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jose Flores, HUD's ADR coordinator. It is my privilege to serve as the master of ceremony for today's remarkable occasion. As we gather here, we are joined not only by our special guests, but also by the spirit of togetherness and unity that defines this year's theme, Todos Somos, Somos Uno. We are all, we are one. This theme serves as a powerful reminder that our strength lies in embracing diverse voices and perspectives, uniting them to shape our collective future. National Hispanic Heritage Month, spanning from September 15 to October 15, holds a significant place in our hearts and histories. This month-long celebration is an annual recognition of timeless traditions and cultural diversity of Hispanic Latino Americans. It's a time when we reflect upon the contributions of those whose roots are traced back to the 20 Latino American countries and territories that make up the tapestry of our collective heritage. As we embark on this month-long journey of celebration and education, let us remember the enduring impact that Hispanic Latino Americans have had on every facet of our society, from arts and culture to science, technology, politics, and beyond. Their stories inspire us. Their achievements motivate us and their resilience uplifts us. So let us embrace this moment to honor the past, celebrate the present, and forge a future where all voices are not only heard, but cherished. Let us come together as one community with unity as our strength and diversity as our foundation. Thank you all for gracing us with this, with gracing us with this occasion with your presence. Let the 2023 Hispanic Heritage Month observers begin as we stand together in the spirit of todos somos, somos unos. We are all, we are one. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to take a moment to stand if you can as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please remain standing as Maria Moreno from FHEO, FHAP Division Program Analyst provides us with a moment of silence and gratitude. Buenas tardes, damas y caballeros, distinguidos invitados y colegas. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow colleagues. It is an honor to stand before you to speak about the importance of giving gratitude during this special occasion. Hispanic Heritage Month is a time to recognize and celebrate the rich cultural contributions of Hispanic and Latinx communities in the United States. It is time to appreciate the diverse traditions, histories, and achievements of our community, but it's also time to express our gratitude, not only for the incredible cultural richness we bring, but also for the invaluable contributions we make to our society. First and foremost, I want to express our gratitude to the Hispanic and Latinx individuals who have dedicated their lives to public service especially those who work within the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Our commitment to creating equitable housing opportunities in vibrant urban communities is truly commendable, and we appreciate your tireless efforts in advancing the mission of this department. 
we must also express our gratitude to the countless Hispanics and Latinx activists, leaders, and advocates who have worked tirelessly to champion social justice and civil rights. This commitment in making our nation more inclusive, equitable, has shaped the very fabric of our society. As we gather to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, let us also remember the importance of unity. Our nation is stronger when we come together to embrace and honor the diversity that makes us unique. We must try to build bridges, understanding, respect, and collaboration among all communities. By doing so, we can create a society that truly reflects the value of justice, e equality, and opportunity for all. In closing, let us carry the spirit, the spirit of gratitude with us beyond this celebration. Let us commit to recognizing and appreciating the, the, the and foster an environment where diversity is celebrated, where every voice is heard, and where opportunities are available to all. Thank you again for celebrating with us Hispanic Heritage Month. Gracias por celebrar con nosotros el mes de la herencia hispana. Now let's please take a moment of silence and gratitude. Thank you, Ms. Moreno. Please take a seat at this time. Thank you again, Ms. Moreno, for that uh, moment of silence. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce one of my colleagues, Ms. Magda Brown, Hispanic Employment Program Manager with the Office of Departmental Equal Employment Opportunity. Ms. Brown has served in the Federal Force for 14 years at HUD for three, including this current position, which she has held, she has held for five months. Ms. Brown also serves with the DC Air National Guard. Magda. By a show of hands, how many of you have heard of Carmen Contreras? As our country entered World War II, we, fa we faced a terrible labor shortage and women entered the workforce in record numbers, forever changing American history. But Puerto Rican Board Contreras wasn't your average volunteer, no. She was the first Hispanic woman to serve in the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps. She requested a dangerous role in the war zone where she was transmitting encoded messages between Eisenhower's headquarters in Algeria and the battlefield in Tunisia. She was also a translator and interpreter in Spanish. Contreras won numerous medals, and she established a path for 200 more Hispanic women during the war who followed in her footsteps. Now, all of you know our late Oscar de la Renta, one of our, of our most famous fashion designers and a proud son of the Dominican Republic. What you might not know is that when he wasn't designing dresses for Jackie Kennedy, Cindy Crawford, Taylor Swift, and Oprah Winfrey, he was financing an orphanage that still takes care of hundreds of children each year. And how about Franklin Chang Diaz? Chang Diaz was born to a very poor family in Costa Rica. And like so many children, maybe like some of your kids, he dreamed of being an astronaut. Chang Diaz came to this country as a teenager without a word of English, but proved to be an outstanding student winning scholarships and eventually graduating with a PhD in physics from MIT. 
Chang Diaz became NASA's first naturalized citizen astronaut. He flew seven missions on the space shuttle and later ran NASA's prestigious Advanced Space Propulsion Laboratory. And there are so many more Hispanic heroes in my pantheon. Sonia Sotomayor, the first Hispanic Supreme Court Justice. Roberto Clemente, not only an extraordinary baseball player, but a great advocate for civil rights and a humanitarian. Not only an extraordinary baseball player, but at the, he died at the age of 38 in a plane crash, unfortunately, while delivering aid to earthquake victims of Nicaragua. And let's not forget the Latino hot secretaries, Henry Cisneros, Mel Martinez, and Julian Castro. But why in the world am I telling you this, right? Why is she telling us this? Because Hispanics have made incredible contributions to our country, the United States of America. Somos gente trabajadora, con corazón y con chispa. We are hardworking, good-hearted people who get the job done. And we are tired of waiting. We are significantly underrepresented at HUD. So what's going on here, right? Hispanics over-indexed in the field of construction. Shouldn't they be able to afford the houses they, they built? HUD is in the business of helping people realize the American dream of home ownership. Yet, within HUD itself, we are not coming through for the single largest minority group in the United States of America. So to address this, I need your awareness and your support. Diversity is what drives, is what drives us and it's the richness and productivity of our country, right? And of HUD. But the people who sound like me are missing. So we need to do better so that Hispanics are recruited, trained, promoted, and retained. And my colleagues, this is up to you. This is up to all of us, right? Though you never know from my accent, I'm an immigrant myself. I left a small town of Cartago Valle, Colombia, when I was a teenager and I came here without a word of English. Um, and, you know, to pursue an education and opportunities in the United States. And I cannot express to you how proud I am to be an American, to serve the country through the Air Force. And what an honor, what an honor it is for me to serve at HUD. It is an honor to be here. Today, I am asking for your support, for your support. Because moving forward, we must make HUD stronger and more representative. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Wayne Williams, the director of the Departmental Equal Employment Opportunity Division and a true champion for driving positive change. Mr. Williams. Greetings to all, to our special guests, our distinguished guests, our hurt colleagues. Now, I had to put on my eyes for a minute, so just give me 30 seconds here. But I'm truly honored to participate in today's event. Todos somos, somos uno. We are all, we are one. It is my esteemed pleasure to introduce the 12th Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Deputy Secretary Adrienne Tartman. Deputy Secretary Tartman has served in numerous leadership roles throughout her career, most recently as the CEO of the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials, and as the Executive Director of the District of Columbia Housing Authority. But it's not the many titles that have made her such a dynamic leader. It's the impact she has made in the organization she has led or been a part of. As Deputy Secretary, she works alongside Secretary Fudge to ensure that the HUD, the HUD has the staff and tools it needs to administer and provide oversight over programs critical to supporting people and communities 
across the country. Through her spirit of partnering and collaboration and her sincere passion for the well-being of the communities, she demonstrates her belief that truly we are all and we are one. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce our esteemed Deputy Secretary, and I hope that you will join me in welcoming her to the stage as someone who's been very impactful and very caring of all communities, and is one of the reasons that she chose the role to fill as Deputy Secretary for her. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I paid Wayne a tremendous amount of money <laughs> to say those wonderful things. Well, buenas tardes, mi amigos y mi amigas. How is everybody doing today? Very, very good. And, and welcome. Welcome to HUD's Hispanic Heritage Month event. And for those of you who may be watching virtually, I'm just saying, a mission a good thing. If you're sitting at your desk, I encourage you to come on down and, and to join your colleagues here. I'd like to really also thank the organizers of today's event. Thank you so much for your effort in making sure we've come together. So this year's theme of Todos Somos Somos Uno translates to we are all, we are one. And it's exactly, exactly what the Secretary and I endeavor to try to make sure we're breaking down silos across the department and not just across our program areas, but who we are as human beings, that we are doing as eloquently said earlier, that we're working in unity with each other on behalf of the American people. And our work, I don't have to tell this crowd, our daily work impacts the lives of millions of people every single day. Whether we're responding to disasters or we're helping people stay housed or find homes for the first time, keeping people safe and giving communities the hope that they need. And this work is done, you know, not by me and the secretary, it's done by all of you. Our accomplishments are really based on yours. And I just want to get a reference point of, of who's in here today. So we're going to do a little particip participatory event here. So I just, I want you to shout out which office you're, you're in because I really want to demonstrate the wealth you all know how to shout out. <laughs> okay, let's start over here. FPM. FPM. ODEO. ODEO. CPD. ODEO. Public Affairs in the House. PIH. Woo! <laughs> That's who else we got? What's that? FHEO. All right, Fair Housing's here. Administration, what do they do? Administration, we got you. Who else? I'm pointing it back. OGC, the lawyers are here. Who else? CIR, Congressional is in the house. What do we have over here? ODEO, I don't know. They say when you're having a party, bring your posse. I see what's happening here, all right? What do we have over here? CPD. Oh, secretaries in the house. Public affairs. Administration. Administration. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and Team DEPSEC. Let's turn for Team DEPSEC over there. <laughs> All right. So we are in this room representing just the wealth of the extraordinary uh, work that HUD does and the breadth of our work from public housing to equal opportunities to making sure we're engaging with communities on the ground, to in making sure we're administering the Fair Housing Act, to making sure we're building homes and doing everything with our community development, making sure we're communicating the work that HUD does, making sure that we are following the laws of the land and HUD's own rules, um, making sure that we are providing the best leadership here at HUD. Thank you all for those accomplishments. It makes us and this country so much stronger. You know, um, when you think about HUD's work and our mission, um, sometimes we don't distill it down to, to its impact. But when I think about just the other day, 
the White House released its uh, housing supply update and tenant protections, think about who, who gets mostly impacted, right? The black community, the Hispanic and Latino community. When we talk about housing affordability, when we think about who's mostly impacted by the fact that we need to build more housing, while it is all of us in this country, it is mostly acute in the Latino community as well. When you think about home ownership, right, we have a lot, we have a lot of ways to go there. You know, 40, the 49% of the Hispanic community are homeowners. I know we can do better. I know that this secretary and I and the FHA commissioner know that we can use HUD's programs to make sure we're increasing that number and reducing the home ownership gap. You've seen some of that work with the reduction of a wonky thing called the reduction of the, the it's a MIPCA, um, to make sure our upfront fees when people are trying to use our FHA mortgage insurance, those upfront, upfront fees are reduced. We looked at ways to better calculate student debt. We know student debt is something that is a barrier to the Latino community as it relates to becoming a homeowner. We looked at ways to calculate student debt to make sure that it wasn't a barrier and credit worthy individuals were able to become homeowners. When you look at the work that we've done to count positive rental payments, right? Think about that for a second. How many first time homeowners are, are not able to really get there because they, they don't have a demonstration of, of, of credit, it's just their rental payments. And so by using positive rental payments as a co contributor to ways in which we are going to help first-time homeowners is a big deal, and HUD has done this. When you think about our fair housing law, right, when people continue to discriminate, even in this day and age, I know it's not surprising to many of us, but people continue to think they can get away by telling folks you can't rent here, you can't live here, you have too many people in your family, right? Still happening. And we're the ones that make sure that we're fighting back. When you think about the promise of the Fair Housing Act, the Affirmably Further in Fair Housing, and the road we have to go down to ensure that the, histem the historic and systemic injustices that's happened to the Latino community are corrected through the breadth and the power of what we're doing with AFFH. Something as simple as translating our darn documents, people, right? Something as simple of, as that, making sure that not only we have these programs, that people have access because they can see how they can apply and what the impact of our programs are. And I'm happy to say that HUD has done a tremendous job in doing that, particularly in our all of our home ownership documents, but it's a damn shame it took till 2023 for some of that to be done. But I'm still proud that we were able to do it. You know, um, our work isn't, y'all here take for folks who did that. You know, our work is not done. Um, in 2021, the most recent American housing survey showed that 47% of very low income Hispanic renter households, about 2 million households across the country, experienced worst case housing needs, meaning they spent more than 50% of their income on rent lived in severely inadequate conditions or, or both. We know that very low income Hispanic households also experience high rates of housing overcrowding. So we know, we know we have more work to do. Sad to say we have, uh, you know, we have a, a, a long road to go down. Um, but here's what I know about that. With this team, with this president, this vice president, who has day one made it sure that access and equity were at the core of how we look at our work. When we look at a secretary who is as fierce as our secretary is, who no matter where she is and whomever she's talking to, makes sure that HUD's programs are targeted to the consumers of those programs and making sure that we are doing right by all people and particularly folks in the Latino community. Representation matters. Um, and to that end, you know, we remain committed to improving the representation of the Latino community here in the Hutt family. I, I commit to that. So look, we've done a lot. There's still a lot to do. Um, we know that we need even more people on the team 
to conduct the heavy lift across all the areas of HUD's work. We know that we need to penetrate communities who may be afraid of government, you know? Folks who are not gonna answer the knock on the door, who are gonna take that envelope from us and throw it away. We need to find ways to really penetrate into the communities so that they can benefit from the work that you all are doing. We know that there is more work to do. But if there is ever a team, if there was ever a team that I trust with this work to make sure that we are getting as much results for our funding and resources in the Latino communities we can, it is this team right here at HUD. Um, they always say, you know, you, you go to war with the army you have, I'll take those odds. Thank you so much for what you are doing. Stay blessed. Wow. Thank, thank you. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for, for, for that, Madam Deputy Adrian Todman. Thank you for, for that. was awesome. Mi gente, that means my people. Hey, you know, uh, as we were talking about the different program offices we ha have here, to me, it's my tribe. You're my tribe. I, I found you guys. HUD has been an awesome thing for me to be here. So with that being said, I would like to introduce our next guest speaker, Ms. Cindy Nava, White House Presidential Appointee, Senior Policy Advisor, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban. Cindy, thank you. Give it, bring it on. Yeah. Buenas tardes. Con ganas. Buenas tardes. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, let me just adjust this. It's great to be here with you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for all of those who are out there virtually joining us. Thank you, Madam Deputy Secretary. Um, thank you to our leader, Secretary Fudge. And thank you to all of you who work day in and day out to coordinate this event. Muchas gracias, Guadalupe um, y Magda. Mil gracias. It's really, really just a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, I had the, the pleasure of taking my oath of office online a year and a half ago. Uh, I am a former DACA recipient. I am the first former DACA recipient to receive a, a White House political appointment. That to me carries a whole lot of responsibility. I'm not telling you as a, with the purpose of bragging, I'm telling you with the purpose of ensuring that I'm not the last one and ensuring that the representation that has been noted is accounted for. I was raised in the state of New Mexico and I come from a hardworking, dedicated immigrant family from Chihuahua, Mexico. I have lots of notes here to share with you, but as I came in, Magda gave me this little awesome pin that I was not able to put on me. But I noticed that it has two chiles. So I've got to tell you, I'm a person who has now a reputation here at HUD for advocating for spicy things. Um, as, <laughs> as someone from the state of New Mexico, you know, green and red are our things. Um, and as my Mexican blood calls out, I love spicy things. So Magda, muchas gracias. Um, it just took me back home for a second when I looked at it. So my apologies for not being able to put it on. But I think there's, uh, there is a theme here, and that is representation, accountability, and how we move forward in a unified fashion. I absolutely believe that we gain more by working together. And as someone who grew up without a social security number, I can't tell you the amount of barriers that I had to surpass. And it took, uh, truly, a village to get me to where I'm at in terms of access, because I was born with none. I arrived here at the age of six to the state of New Mexico, of course, with undocumented parents from Chihuahua. Until this day, my father works as a construction worker and my mother cleans houses for a living. I don't come from this world but I've learned to operate within it. And I carry, in every single space that I go into, I feel the responsibility. I felt it since the moment that I arrived to HUD. I felt it from the moment that I did education policy advocacy and all the other work that I had the opportunity to, to undertake. And every single time that I'm it's sitting in a space here, whether it's at HUD or in the White House, I've gotta tell you, I know that it's an opportunity that my parents won't have. I know that my parents don't get to sit at the tables that I get to sit at and where I get to be questioned by others because believe me, I've been questioned left and right. Qu 
questioned about sharing my story, questions about sharing items or things that may not be prevalent to other communities. But at the end of the day, I believe it matters. And I believe every single one of our stories matters. Because at the end of the day, we're not working in separate silos. If we're working against one another the way that systemically we've been doing for many years, we're not getting anywhere. We're at a point where we have to value each other, value those cultural differences, because those cultural differences are cultural strengths. And I deeply, deeply believe that each one of you makes this country who we are. And I'm beyond proud to work for an administration. And I'll tell you that, you know, I absolutely had, ne I never dreamt of uh, receiving an appointment this early on as a, a US citizen of only two years. Um, and someone who for a lifetime was undocumented, that just doesn't happen to you. It, it does not happen. So I will tell you, the day that I got the call about the appointment, I was mortified because I didn't think that I would, under, I I would pass all of the, the vetting because of being undocumented. But Lord behold, it did, and it worked. And I arrived, and I arrived to a place where as Magda said, yes, we are severely underrepresented, Magda. It's very evident but where I think there lies a world of opportunity, where we have leadership who care and who are adamantly working to ensure that we open those, those doors and not only open them, but actually generate access, generate opportunities, because it's one thing to say things. It's another thing to do things. And in this world, I believe we need doers. And that is what I am committed to doing left and right. And I will tell you, coming in and, and working in the space of HUD has been enlightening and again, has led me to carry out a little almost informational campaign of my own when I, um, I became a homeowner two, two and a half years ago and I qualified from FHA mortgage access for DACA recipients also. Um, so I have taken it upon myself to ensure that in every space that I get to go to or at every office that I get to visit across the country that, we, that I share that information. And through our office at FPM, it provides that, that opportunity. And we have leadership who help expand the, those voices because we want to ensure that our communities and DACA recipients know that we have resources at the table and that we will continue working to expand those. So once again, we are here to work together. We are here to continue advancing this. And I am more than committed to ensure, to ensure you that I believe that by doing this in a unified fashion, we're gonna advance this to a whole new level. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos. It is an honor of a lifetime to be with you all and to serve. And espero que podamos continuar trabajando juntos de aquí en adelante. Muchas gracias. At this time, I'd like to introduce Jessica Vasquez, who's the president of the Latino Network at HUD and Operation Division Director. Jessica. Hello, everyone. So today's theme and this month's theme is we are all and we are one. Identity is very personal and there are many ways in which we identify that and affects how we present ourselves and show up in the world. Our identity can be social, gender, racial, and in many combinations. Everyone has intersectional experiences that have shaped our trajectory, the roads taken and those not taken. And so for me, social identities and forms of oppression shaped not only my ancestors' experiences, but also my own. These experiences shape my why. And we've all heard our uh, esteemed secretary and deputy secretary ask us, what's your why? And so while I have multiple stories, I appreciate the opportunity to share at least one of my whys, why Latino network at HUD. So I go back to my maternal family and my paternal fam family line. My maternal family line are descendants of slaves in Puerto Rico and are from a rural Western part of the island. My paternal family are descendants of immigrants from Southern Spain who were given land in Puerto Rico 300 years ago. And I identify an M Afro Latina. The Spanish flu and tuberculosis killed many of my ancestors and many families became blended. My maternal great-grandmother raised the children of two of her sisters and they became her own. They became prima hermanas, more than just cousins, sister cousins. 
their children were raised together and three generations later, I identify with many of my cousins as prima hermanas. When my grandmothers were young women in Puerto Rico, both trying to support and raise families under different types of economic duress, my maternal grandmother was from rural Western Puerto Rico. My paternal grandmother was working for a part of metropolitan San Juan area. In the early 50s, both of my abuelas from different parts of the island made the difficult decision to move their families to New York for employment opportunities. They did so knowing that they were now going to have to navigate systems in a new language and culture, but they were resilient. And my abuelas stepped up to meet a family need. My maternal aunt was born male. She died in the late 80s, a victim of the AIDS epidemic. While she knew I loved her, I never got the chance to tell her how proud I was of her. Excuse me. So for her and all of my trans, gay, and lesbian family members and friends, I am an ally. <clears throat> my parents were young when they arrived in New York. Both learned English, navigated multiple forms of oppression, racism, and classism in New York City in the 50s and 60s. They were resilient and remain so today. When my mom's prima hermana died at an early age from cancer, my parents stepped up to raise my cousin. We were young, never used the primo and prima, and we are siblings. And so today I identify as a sister to six. The stories and modeling of my ancestors, my grandparents, my parents have all shaped my why. They stepped up when needed. And so this brings me to Why Latino Network. Those at HUD who identify as Latino or Hispanic are Black, White, Indigenous, Middle Eastern, Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, gay, trans, non-binary, and more. We're pretty awesome with our intersectionality of identities. We've seen some progress in representation in society, some. So today on Netflix, you can turn on and watch the story of Mexican-American Jose Hernandez and his inspiring journey to become a NASA astronaut. On PBS, we can learn the impact of racial and labor justice activist Dolores Huerta. We have in the Supreme Court, Justice Sonia Sotomayor. And we are well aware of the way in which Lin-Manuel Miranda has revolutionized theater, music, and entertainment. While representation is increasing in culture, representation of Hispanics across federal government is low and HUD is no different. We're about 5% below the target based on the civilian labor force. There are about three executive, senior executives who identify as Latino Hispanics out of over 100. So almost two years ago, the leader of the Latino network left HUD. And uh, as a result, a few of us stepped up. So Tracy Vargas, Dan Gomez, and I, we reinvigorated the Latino network. We knew Latinos were leaving HUD at a higher rate than we were hiring them. So when Migdalia left HUD, I was concerned. Um, my initial vision was to quickly reestablish the ERG to offer programming. And now we have grown to becoming a strategic partner to HUD in the retention and staff development of Latinos. We've been at the table to discuss policy and the barriers to Hispanic participation at HUD. We've expressed the value of our ERGs to managers and program offices across HUD. And we've held development sessions to support the retention and professional growth of Hispanic HUD employees. Resume and interview workshops, member discussions on recruitment, informational se sessions on financial literacy. So this next year, we're gonna to go to the next level with our programming and support of Latinos at HUD. We've heard our members and we're gonna have a facilitated dialogue with our acting chief diversity officer on a potential name change. We've partnered with Ochico to offer a series on the pathway to SES and we'll have monthly professional development programming on resume writing, interviewing and developing a public service career. Like my ancestors, mi abuelas, my parents and my family, I've stepped up with my hand out to help others along the way. And so today, my why, my journey forward, and my story includes supporting the, the current and future Latino leaders at HUD. And I invite all of you to walk with me, join and support the Latino network, as well as all of the other ERGs. And collectively, let's do our part to engage employees, offer a sense of belonging, foster a diverse and inclusive workplace. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, for that. Appreciate it. Thank you all the, the great information. And we have a special presentation by uh, Ms. Guadalupe Herrera, and I'm going to bring her up, and I'm going to let her do the rest.
Guadalupe. Jessica, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, Jessica has been a really great leader with respect to the Latino network, and I'm just really very happy that she's taken the lead uh, along with Tracy Vargas and Dan Gomez. All of them have been just phenomenal as far as trying to help the Latinos within HUD and to promote those that are interested in getting further into their careers with respect to um, uh, within respect to the federal government. So I think this is great and it's wonderful and I really admire you and admire all the folks that have been working with you. Thank you very much for all of that. Thank you. <laughs> with that said, my name is Guadalupe Herrera and I can go on and talk about, you know, the fact that uh, I started recently the Hispanic Image Organization within had, uh, and I say recently, before, um, we, we do have a Latino network that's doing a phenomenal job as it pertains to uh, the uh, upper mobility and opportunities that we have as Latinos here at HUD. I, on the other hand, uh, started out with a group called National Image uh, that came out of California. Um, National Image, uh, although I started with National Image, uh, we revamped the program or revamped the organization to Hispanic Image here at HUD uh, for purposes of working with youth at this time. Uh, youth right now is a, a group of people that the young people are, um, these are the children that have not yet graduated from middle school, have not yet graduated from high school, and if we don't get them into college, we are not doing service to our Latino young people at this point. So uh, I have really been focusing on trying to get us to push Latinos out of high school and getting them into college, because only then can we get Latinos to uh, even be considered to work here at HUD or be considered to work in any of our government organizations. And it's really important that we do that, that we focus on, on our youth. With that said, I've, um, and with this newly created organization, which by the way, we are looking for members, okay? Latino Network is looking for members and so is the Hispanic image that we have here at HUD. We want people out on the streets working on their own time, okay? To touch the lives of young people, to touch the lives of people who work here at HUD. It's really important that we touch their lives as well and help them, guide them through what is a career path for them. Okay, and that's the importance of having people such as Jessica, such as Dan Gomez, such as Tracy Vargas, because these are the people who have been in the system and are learning how to get the training and education that they need within the organization to move forward in their particular careers. And everybody here who's in the, in the audience as well, I appreciate all of you guys being here and appreciate you know, the work that you guys all do in your respective communities. With that said, I want to talk about my story. Um, my story started in Delano, California. And it started with um, an organization called the United Farm Workers of America. Uh, my father, Alfredo Herrera, who's here on stage with me today, uh, was one of the original uh, marchers who marched from uh, Delano, California, back in 1966 to Sacramento. And, um, he was very young, as you can tell in these photos, that uh, uh, when he first participated with the United Farm Workers, um, the march itself to Sacramento was pretty heavy, and I think one of the greatest sacrifices, I think, to allow people such as myself, Jessica, and many of you who are here today, um, to be in the positions that we're all in with respect to our, our careers and what we do. His march, his sacrifice, and this is what I am so proud of um, with respect to my family. Um, my father is an American citizen. He was born here in the United States, in Texas. And if you talk to him, he thinks Texas is a whole country of its own. Uh, but that's my father. He's always taught me Texas is its own country, okay? Uh, okay, Dad. <laughs> anyway, but... Um, he, with his spirit and my mother's help, they became boycott organizers. Becoming boycott organizers in the movement back in the 60s, guys, was not an easy feat at all. 
uh, one, very little education, uh, the other also um, more sacrifice than anything else. We're talking about people who were being paid $5 a week. That's what my father and my mother did as a sacrifice, $5 a week with the United Farm Workers. Yes, they helped us with food, they helped us with uh, expenses uh, such as gasoline or getting the cars fixed and things like that, but for the most part, the sacrifice was there that my parents basically both did. And I would not be here, I really would not be here if it wasn't for those sacrifices. As I was mentioning earlier, my father marched 300 miles, and I say 300 miles plus because he went from the very beginning in Delano, California, with a few, about 80-some people that initially started the march and ended with over 10,000 people in Sacramento. That was when his eyes just opened up and could not believe, wow, we did this, he did this, you know? But it wasn't that simple. My father's feet were so blistered that they had to send him home in the middle of the march. He didn't want to go. And part of the reason was a little bit vanity. I have to tell you, it was a little bit vanity. Um, my father was 26 years old when he started the march, okay? Cesar Chavez was 35 years old. And um, Cesar Chavez marched every single day for those 25 days of marching. My father got really upset because the doctor said to him, you have to go home. Your feet are too blistered, you cannot go on. He went home one night. My grandfather did a remedy on his feet back then, and uh, that remedy of, on his feet helped take care of the blisters, and he was able to walk the next day. He went back to the march. He was not gonna let Cesar Chavez <laughs> walk the whole way, who's 10 years older than him, Okay, and he not be able to, you know, get to Sacramento with everybody else. So he was going to do that. And these are the sacrifices. This is the sacrifice that my father, my father made for me and my siblings so that we would have a better quality of life. And that is what I am here to honor the past. Because it's not just, it's not just my father. The people who were up here, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, Larry Iglion, all of these people came together knowing that they had to unite. They had to unite in order to be able to really make this a, a, a unified front. It was not going to happen unless there was a unified front between all of the different groups that were impacted in the fields of California. And they came together. As you can see, Cesar here in this particular picture is shaking hands with the, I think it was uh, um, Gaiman? George Lucas. Uh, George Lucas with uh, respect to signing contracts. The most number of contracts were signed in 1973. No, 1970. In 1970, the highest number of contracts were signed with the United Farm Workers and the growers in the San Joaquin Valley. Okay, uh, that is a major accomplishment. That's the accomplishment that my family, the legacy that my family got to live through and got to make an impact. And it wasn't, as I said, it was not an easy uh, path uh, for the family. Um, I, I have to tell you, a lot of the stuff that we did as kids, we were in that car. If you can see the car up here in the picture, uh, you can see very a small corner or portion of my face, but my sister smack in the middle, my brother and my kid sister. We're talking California. We're talking over 100 degree temperatures, okay? And we're in the car waving at our parents as they're marching by, you know? That was our education. That was my education. That was my sister's education. That is what is in our hearts. And that is why we really believe in the need to unify, in the need to help those who have less than we do. We started out with less. We're very privileged now with respect to our careers. We're very privileged with our respect to our education. And we need to bring others forward with that as well. And that means young people. And that means our people who are coming along with respect to, and, and when I say our people, I mean poor people, people who don't have that opportunity that hopefully we can make that opportunity 
for them. Um, with that said, I do have to say one last thing, and that is that I'm going to be running the national CFC campaign this year, and I'm going to be looking for all of you guys out in the field as well as here to donate. All of you guys have to donate to your favorite causes because it's really important that we continue to support those causes for the homeless, for people who are trying to get a better quality of life. With that said, I want to introduce my father and present him to you, Alfredo Herrera. He was a farm worker. He was a boycott organizer in Colorado, and I'm just super, super proud of being his daughter. Thank you. song and we all had to learn it he said we have to learn it uh, growing up I was five six seven years old um, and my sister even younger than me and one of the things that uh, we did with this song was learn how to sing it and how to play the guitar to sing it so that we can um, promote what it says and it's really more of a it's a song from the heart okay This is a bit impromptu, but we wanted to make sure that while he was here and in front of everyone um, in the room as well as virtually, that we recognize Mr. Herrera. Because I think that one of the things that we are witnessing right now, this is, this is community in action. This is history unfolding. This is someone who walked where history was made, who made a difference as it pertains to civil rights, as it pertains to equal opportunity, as it pertains to diversity. When you build a community, it's not about just putting a house, erecting a house or erecting an apartment building. It's about the people who fill those homes. It's about the people who fill those apartment buildings and make those structures homes. Mr. Herrera, we thank you for, for creating a home in the community and for building a pathway for others to do the same. And so we have a little certificate that we would like to give you in honor of that. And it says, I want to pull it out, I apologize. What? One of the things that it says at top, it says, thank you for making a difference. Um, todos somos, somos uno. Thank you for making a difference. Because without you, your daughters, and all of us who are here wouldn't be where we are. So thank you, sir.
strong, but I can't play it. I want to say my computer. Oh, is it? Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. Uh, that's that was that was really really great. Great rendition makes me want to go back to learning how to play guitar. It just bring back something in me. Um, I want to say thank you for gracing us with a beautiful rendition of De Colores. Uh, your performance added a touch of culture richness and vibrancy to our event. And then with Wayne following with that, it just made it even more better. So thank you, Wayne, very much. As we transition further into the heart of our program, it is my pleasure to introduce our next distinguished uh, speaker, Ms. Claudia Monterosa. With a wealth of expertise and dedication to her role, Ms. Monterosa serves as a Deputy Assistant Secretary for grant programs. Thank you, ma'am. Here you go. Let's give a hand. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Que placer, it's an honor to be here uh, as part of the celebration. Uh, mi nombre es Claudia Monterrosa y soy salvadoreña. Y lo digo con mucho orgullo. Woo! I'm a little emotional because I didn't think I was going to be like this, but I'm here because of my mother, who's no longer here with us. And she will be so proud for me to be able to reach this because uh, I am a US born American citizen. But my parents are Salvadorian. And actually, both of them met in California, in Los Angeles. So it took both of them separate pathways to meet in Los Angeles in the 1960s. And they got together and they got married and they had us, my brother and I. Um, one thing led to another, and my parents decided to uproot us and take us back to El Salvador. So I'm a reverse immigrant. I was born here, I went to school, uh, and then I, uh, we lived in El Salvador, uh, in Santa Ana, El Salvador. And I did all my formative years there. And um, during that time, the Civil War started in 1979. So we were, uh, I guess, a little bit lucky that we didn't get the brunt of the Civil War during that time uh, because it started in 1979. So the heart of it was in the middle of the country and um, was exposed to all of that. And one thing led to another, and it ended up that my mother and I immigrated back here uh, in the 80s, right in the middle of the, of the Civil War. And so here I find myself in the 1980s not knowing English anymore, right? Because I grew up in El Salvador. Everything was fully, fully Spanish. So I had to relearn how to adapt to a new society. And I found myself being a, a ESL student in Southgate, California, in southeast areas of, uh, of Los Angeles. And that was amazing, an amazing and shocking experience, right? Because I was in a sea of Latinos in Southgate, yet I was an immigrant and also a stranger. And so I had to readapt myself to how to integrate myself, not only into the US culture, but also Latino culture, which is a very different you know, experience coming in as an immigrant, a reverse immigrant, is what I call myself. So one of the things that I experienced was, you know, the injustices that happened during the, those formative years in El Salvador and my passion to really work with people, always, even for, for, from being very, very young. And one of the first things that I experienced here in my early years was housing insecurity because it was just my mom and I. So since that time frame, you know, housing has been an incredibly important thing for me in civil rights and fighting for what is right and really working with community around me. So grassroots organizing, that was one of the first things that I did when I went to college and I had the opportunity to do that and I had to advocate for myself because guess what? My mom was a garment worker and so she did not have the opportunity 
to be in school with me or to go and advocate for myself as an ESL student. And so I had to learn that on my own, how to do that because if they hear you with an accent or they think that you're an immigrant that you don't know math or English or that you cannot learn quickly. Well, I have to say that I came in as a 10th, in the middle of the 10th grade and I graduated with honors in a school of over 900, stu 900 students in less than two and a half years. But that was also a testament to my mom being able you know, to, to continue to work and say, here is the land of opportunity, and here I wanted to make sure that we came back to your rightful birth, right? Like, you're, you were born here, so let's take advantage of that. And that I have, but I have that responsibility on my back, like, I want to be able to always be there for the folks that do not have a voice. And I have made it my life really work uh, to do that. And so I have done organizing. I have worked with nonprofit organizations. I have worked in education. I have worked with parents throughout the entire United States to really acclimate them and their children on how to integrate into this um, society because it is tough. Education is not the same in Latin America as it is here in the United States. Um, you know, it's just a different way of how we look at education. So I think education and housing and the continued fight for the correct, for the civil rights is the right approach to do these things. And so the other passion of mine is housing, right? And I never in my million years thought that I would get the call to serve here. I had, I had the privilege now, knowing my experience and working for decades on housing and everything related to housing, to be able to serve under this administration to now be in charge of programming that affects millions of people across the United States. On the CDBG side, on the home side, on the uh, uh, disaster relief, uh, re disaster recovery side, it's incredible the amount of money and the amount of responsibility that HUD and what I have here in this role. And I take it exceedingly seriously and it's an honor of a lifetime to be able to be here uh, by others providing me that opportunity. So I thank uh, Mary McFadden, who's the Principal Assistant Secretary here at HUD, for making that call and be able to open that opportunity and seeing me, uh, that opportunity to hear, you're in charge of the Office of Grant Programs and let's make this work. We have the uh, opportunity to really carry on the uh, administration goals that I see here at HUD really being implemented. I, that was one of the first things that, I, that really astonished me <laughs> is that our secretary, our deputy secretary, really do mean what we say. And I mean to do what I say, and I mean to be and continue to travel and meet with our entitlement organizations and, and, and stakeholders and really see how our money is reaching or not reaching the intended recipients because that is our responsibility. At the end of the day, HUD is about people and housing those folks. And our money, the money that I oversee, is a big part of that. So I really would not be here without my mother, who I miss dearly, dearly. And I just really want to thank her. So thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for, for being here. Thank you, Claudia, for that. As you can see, it's, it's, I'm amazed at how many stories of the the journeys we've all taken and where it leads us to. Um, it's, been, it's, been, it's been emotional. So uh, my next uh, person I'd like to bring up is uh, Mr. Ifran Maldonado. Make sure I'm saying that right. Um, and he is the Field Policy and Management Office Director from Puerto Rico's Vibrant Culture to the Heart of Our Work. Uh, Ifran. Buenas tardes a todos. Um, thank you very much uh, for being here, and it is an honor for me also to be part of this great celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month 
And of course, I want to start by thanking our Deputy Secretary, uh, Adrian Totman, for supporting this event. And to the organizers, especially to Guadalupe Herrera, who reached out to me. Um, and I couldn't be here without the support of my FPM leadership, ADS, um, Michelle Perez, and the RA, Tiffany Cup. I want to thank them. And also, um, uh, I want to thank Rosana Torres, Senior Advisor for the Secretary, for all the support that she has given uh, me and the field office uh, in Puerto Rico through uh, her um, stay here at HUD. Uh, I feel very proud of being Hispanic and of my Hispanic heritage, and I know that my accent shows that, so I'm going to ask you to please bear with me. Um, I am the son of a Puerto Rican father and a Mexican mother, and that combination has helped me um, appreciate the diversity within the Hispanic community. Um, we are as diverse as the number of Hispanic countries on this planet. Um, and I always tell people that in my house, uh, we eat Mexican tacos and Puerto Rican rice and beans as part of the same menu. <laughs> um, but within that diversity, uh, language, culture, family values, and aspirations for equity really unite us. Uh, I believe that. Uh, I was a little bit scared to commit to come, and I told Guadalupe uh, because this week is the peak of our hurricane season uh, for the Caribbean. And a day like today, in 2017, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico and devastated the island of Puerto Rico and also affected the U.S. Virgin Islands. A week like this week, uh, last year, Hurricane Fiona uh, affected Puerto Rico. Thanks God, nothing has happened. Thus far, where we are watching um, um, what is being uh, happening in the Atlantic Ocean, so please um, keep us in your prayers. Despite that, I really wanted to come because in my 25 years at HUD, this is the first time Puerto Rico gets invited to this type of gathering, okay? Um, and of course, uh, I couldn't say no, and I felt uh, really compelled and uh, with a huge responsibility to re represent um, the employees of the San Juan Field Office, where we serve over 3.2 million Hispanics living in Puerto Rico and uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and I believe that is one of the highest concentrations of Hispanics in the country. So yes, we want to continue to be invited. We want to be part of this larger community of Hispanics. It's really, it really means a lot to us because we are in the Caribbean. Sometimes we feel secluded because of those geographical reasons. Um, but we also sometimes feel excluded. And that has historical reasons. And I want to take a few moments to share with you some interesting facts about that. Um, some of you may know that in 1899, after the Spanish-American War and through the Treaty of Paris, Puerto Rico became an unincorporated territory of the United States. That means that we are not a state with the same constitutional rights of a state, but a possession of the United States under the plenary powers of Congress as established by the U.S. Constitution. That means that Congress is the one who disposes of how Puerto Rico is treated in terms of the applicability of federal laws and federal programs. A Congress where we do not have full representation because contrary to incorporated states, Puerto Rico has no senators and has only one representative called a resident commissioner as a member of the House. That member has limited voting rights as compared to other representatives. For example, the commissioner has no right to vote for the final passing of bills, even those related to Puerto Rico. There is no apportionment of districts by population for the selection of representatives of the people. So this single resident commissioner represents five times as many US citizens as the average member of the House. Moreover, residents of Puerto Rico do not have the right to vote during presidential elections. In 1917, Congress granted American citizenship to all the residents of Puerto Rico, but once again, a citizenship with limited benefits while living in Puerto Rico. 
To give you an example, very recently in 2021, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of a law passed by Congress in 1972, which excluded Puerto Rico residents from the Supplementary Security Income Program, or SSI. So basically, that case reaffirmed that not all federal programs or benefits apply to the U.S. citizens living in Puerto Rico. And I mentioned this uh, deliberately because these limitations pose an enormous challenges to the U.S. citizens living in Puerto Rico in terms of obtaining federal equity. So what do we do? We always ask ourselves um, to help with that. And in my experience while working for the federal government, I believe equity has been obtained in many instances through the support of great federal government officials with an ingrained sense of equity within them. And through the support of the larger community of people who want to help, including the Hispanic community. I remember that after the devastation caused by Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico six years ago, I read in the news how important Hispanic leaders here in the US, powerful Hispanic institutions, and the Hispanic community at large here in the US strongly advocated in Congress on behalf of Puerto Rico. And I have no doubt that such support played a role in the historical appropriation of the disaster funds for the island. So similarly, to, take sh to make sure our HUD programs work in Puerto Rico, we have always found great people within HUD, both careers and politicals, who have understood the challenges we face and they need to do anything within their power and discretion to look at and eventually treat Puerto Rico through the lens of equity. Amongst those persons within this agency, I must mention our current Deputy Secretary, Adrian Totman, and our HUD Secretary, Honorable Marsha Fudge. This year, she had a chance to look at a very old law which excluded Puerto Rico from applying the definition used across CONUS for what it means to be an extremely low-income family. She looked at this, I believe, with equity in mind and used her authorities provided by law to level the playing field for extremely low-income residents of Puerto Rico when applying and qualifying based on income for HUD-assisted housing in Puerto Rico and anywhere else in CONUS. So just as we in Puerto Rico um, uh, work daily to help our jurisdictions, I know that all of you work for your specific communities to bring benefits and equity to them, which is precisely what moves my passion uh, for a career in government. Uh, this great agency gave me the opportunity to enter the federal workforce in 1998 after spending five years in community development in the nonprofit sector and helped me move up the ladder from FPM management analyst to field office director. So for our younger Hispanic employees who are listening today um, and aspire to be leaders within this great agency, I encourage you to do your part, uh, work hard, train hard, complete your higher education, find good mentors, stay involved in your community and with affinity groups such as um, these Hispanic networks, uh, but most importantly, find your passion. I have found my passion in helping to make our programs work in the jurisdictions of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and I have found my passion in helping them recover from disasters. But as I have implied from the beginning of my remarks, this will not be possible without your support as um, hot colleagues, hot leaders, and as part of the Hispanic community. So thank you once again for the opportunity to be here. Somos uno, we are one. Dios les bendiga. Gracias. Gracias, Fran, for those, those words. Uh, our, next, our next speaker um, will be, uh, make sure that I get all this right, yes. Uh, will be Miss um, Elizabeth De Leon, Bargava, Assistant Secretary for Administration, who shares her journey through HUD. Thank you.
Elizabeth de Leon Bargava. I'm the Assistant Secretary for Administration at HUD. Well, I grew up in Washington Heights, New York, so I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer, and so I focused on both. While in high school, I was school president, I was president of Model UN, I was in Academic Olympics. I grew up in a community that can speak Spanish at the bodega. And going to Binghamton, upstate New York, I really experienced for the first time what it felt like to be a minority, to be, to be someone um, that didn't always feel included. Worked with the Bloomberg administration at the Department of Small Business Services. I was responsible for the Neighborhood Development Division, the CDBG funding that was provided to New York City. Watching my mom walk through the halls of the Senate building and her looking around and looking at me and saying, like, you're here. And I'm, you know, she's an immigrant woman from that used to wash clothes on rocks in Salcedo and in Rio. And she was watching her daughter testify before the Senate committee. It didn't matter what happened. I think for her and I, it, it meant we had arrived, that we had accomplished what she wanted us to accomplish as a team, as women, as strong women. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for, for your enlightening remarks that have added that insight to our gathering. So as we continue to our program, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next segment, special presentation of certificates. So at this time, I'd like to bring up Magda, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. And again, I would like to repeat, um, as Ms. Uh, Guadalupe stated, I'm the Hispanic Employment Program Manager. I've been in this job for five months. First and foremost, this event could not have happened today without the assistance of my chain of command. So I want to give it up for Ms. Tanya Watson, if you can stand up. I know. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Also, Mr. Wayne Williams from ODO as well. Yeah. That's right. Woo! And let's please give it up for all of our team of ODEO, including Mr. Jose Flores. Woo! That's right. This could not have happened without your assistance. So thank you so much. And lastly but not least, Ms. Guadalupe Herrera and family. Woo! Without you, this could not have happened. And of course, Mr. Jose Flores. Let's give it up for him one more time. Best MC, he brought the salsa, he brought the Latin, he does amazing. So now, we would like to actually honor uh, all of you, and if you can just please, when you hear your name, just step to the podium so that we can give you a small token of appreciation. So thank you for making a difference. Again, todos somos, somos uno. Thank you so much. All right. So we're gonna start, we would like to thank Ms. Maria Moreno, who was a virtually, who attended, who participated today virtually, as well as Ms. Uh, Jessica Vasquez, thank you so much. And if, um, and we also wanna thank you, Honorable Adrian Totman. But now with Ms. Cindy Nava, thank you so much, ma'am, if you can come up on stage, thank you, ma'am. Let's give it up again for Miss Cindy Nava. What an honor and what representation she gives us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. She said, thank you so much. Appreciate you very much. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Miss Guadalupe Herrera. Yes. She took hers. So. Woo! 
Thank you so much, God. Ms. Maria Herrera. Woo! Miss Claudia Monterrosa. And uh, lastly, but not least, we also have uh, Ms. Michelle Perez and uh, Ms. Uh, Elizabeth de Leon Bargava, and we will just make sure uh, to get that to her. We also have certificates for um, everyone who participated, all of our volunteers. Thank you so much. And we will be uh, giving those to you. Thank you so very much, Mr. Williams. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Let me pass the mic to Mr. Flores. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Thank you, everybody. Hey, this was great. So I think we have some, some uh, samplings in the back once we get. But I just want to say, damas y caballeros, ladies and gentlemen, just thank you for, for being here, those who are in person, and everybody that came. It's been stupendous, mi gente. That means it's been awesome, my people, just so you know. So, hey, I want everybody to, you know, have a great day. Thank you, and I hope that... What you heard up here made an impact, and, and we can move with, with that forward. So with that being said, this ends our program, and we'll have some samplings in the back. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias.